title of my message, Teresa came out and says, what's the title of your message? I said, it's go to what? <laughs> go to church. Yeah, well, I had someone say, oh, who did that over here? Someone's like, oh, church. Did you know you will stand in, listen, I'm going to be really transparent this morning, and then I'll wait for my phone call from Pastor John and Pastor Roger on Monday morning, okay? But you guys are going to take it this morning and, and love it, because I'm doing this in love. It's biblically grounded, and I encourage you to challenge me on it. I really do, um, because you just shouldn't be sitting in these pews just eating whatever we feed you, right? You should be looking at it and litmus testing it. And if you have questions, tell us. But I'm telling you what, in the last several months, I have seen the importance of the church. Where the church is going and the average time a person spends at church, you will actually spend more time waiting in line than you will at church. There's something wrong with that. There's something incredibly wrong with the fact that it's, a, it's an absolute burden for you to come and show up on Sunday morning on a regular basis. Did you know the more you spend at church, the more time you spend, the more consistent you are on a Sunday morning service, and I'll bring other statistics, the more you're there, it's a quotient to your quality of life. You are happier. Not Things aren't easier. You're happier. You have more finances. If you tithe more, you have more finances. Did you know people that report tithing on, an ad, on a regular basis report having more finances? The, I wish you could see this on the CD. I slapped myself in the head. It kind of hurt. But listen, I'm not, listen, you want to, one of my points isn't even tithing. I'm going to tell you why you should come to church biblically, and tithing is one of them. I came up with 40 reasons in the Bible, and I'm not even done. Okay? But here's the thing. You'll spend more time waiting in line than coming to church on Sunday if you're the average churchgoer. That's sad. That's sad to me. That broke my heart. And I begin to look at the statistics of where our schools are at, where our government's at, where our spending's at. The laws that have been passed that are anti-human, anti-life. And it's a direct quotient. The more we see that dwindle, the more it goes. And yet I look at other countries where we see the church is propelling there. We're seeing a rise of charismatic evangelicals across the world and across the globe. And a lot of those societies, they're building up their economy. They're building up their education. Their crime rate is going down. How many of you know Dave? Remember Dave Ogren? Yeah. We just did an outreach. And I say we. I'm part of that ministry. Hopefully you guys are. We just did an outreach. Guess what the result of that outreach was? Thousands upon thousands of people come to know Jesus. But over the last month, the crime rate has dropped 20%. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen, there's something that God knows that we don't know. We just need to grab onto it. And it's the fact that you need church. You need the body. And one thing I'm so sick and tired of is hearing about this. Oh, the church isn't made to be big. It's not for the establishment. What a bunch of garbage. What about the 3,000 that were added to the name? It says it was added to them in one town. I can guarantee you there were churches that were larger than 1,000. It's historically accurate. It's known. We know in the upper room alone they could have fit over 150 people in that. They had over 100 people in it. So don't, don't pass this. Listen, Francis Chan, I love him. But there's been this doctrine going around saying, I don't need church on a regular basis. You need to make church at home. Boy, your church better be at home every day. It better be every day. It says, listen, if two or more gather my name, I shall be there. And we have a Holy Spirit that petitions on our behalf. Don, Holy Spirit, God's showing up. That's the way it should be in your house. It's absolute garbage to sit there and say, the home church replaces this church. I'm sorry, I don't find it. I think the home church is supposed to be your cell group, your small groups. Well, we heard the testimonies this morning. The small group is part of it. If we look in the Bible, and I'm going to give you guys some examples, or examples of the large church and the people at home. It doesn't say home church. It says the people at home. Did you know that as we look at statistics, the more you go to church, the stronger your marriage is? How many of you would like to sign up for something you could take? I'll write you a prescription that would reduce your chance of divorce down to 3%. Who would take that? Who would so only a few people want their marriage to last? 
What is church? <laughs> How many of you want a strong, lasting marriage? How about I ask that? You know your odds right now are about, well, if you're, if you're in the church, it's about 40%, despite what the world tells you. But listen, if you go to an evangelical, charismatic church, you read the Bible every day, you read and pray with your wife every day, and you go to church at least 48 weeks out of 52, your chance of divorce rate is anywhere from 13 to 3%. Hi, who said amen? God bless you, whoever said that. Jesus is the answer. God has the wisdom. He tells us that. And yet we want to show up. Listen, guys, let me ask you this. How would you feel if your pastors only came to church and only read our Bible 30 times a year? What? Oh, you, you wouldn't like that? Then why do we do it? Why does the church do it? I'm, listen, I'm not condemning you guys. I hope you know that. But these are real statistics. This is real stuff, you guys. Listen, here's some pure research. This one is not very old at all. Americans who give reasons other than non-belief for eschewing religious services on a fairly regular basis. Now, they, what they deem as a fairly regular basis is way too much to me. But this is that's what's sad. This is like, hey, if they show up once a month. Only once a month. That's not regular basis, guys. I think... In my opinion, and I'm hoping you guys will understand that once we go through these verses. I have, uh, how many verses I got? Like, I got four chapters and, I don't know, 30 verses. We probably won't get through them all. For 10 points. And this isn't all of them. But I believe you're going to see this the way God intended us to see it. Listen, do you think it's by coincidence that God had Paul write the letters and that God saw it fit to be put in his divine word, his awe-inspired Holy Spirit-driven word? that a majority of the letters are to the church and the ones that aren't are to someone who needs to help the church? The average size of that church was well into the thousands. So let's throw off this stupid Francis Chan. Listen, people have taken and ran with it. Francis Chan's a good man. Love him to death. But this garbage of we don't need a church body to congregate under one roof is, is, is not right. And we can get into argument, is the church for the believer or unbeliever? You want to know something? It's for both. That's the truth. I used to be really, really legalistic on one side, like the church is for the believer and only. And, and we see that, but with the New Testament, it changed. Jesus went to church. It says it in the Bible. Not only did he go to church, he went on a regular basis, and he was a scholar of the word. We know that. He was teaching other people. It was unheard of. For a man his age, a young kid actually, the first time he was teaching in the synagogue, to be teaching. People who identify as Christians who att attend at least monthly is 91%. People that go to church, only 91% of them identify as Christians. That's weird to me. That's just, that's just messed up. But here's what's, here's what's even more disturbing. Those who pray on a daily basis is left in 71%. What shocked me more than anything is percent of people who say who are somewhat, religion is somewhat important or very important in their life. So people who say this is important to me attend at least monthly, but then all of a sudden we look at the statistics of two weeks or three weeks out of the four, or four weeks out of four, and it just drops significantly. To the point of, like I said, you will literally stand in line longer in your lifetime than you will go to church if you're the average Christian nowadays. That's crazy to me. Could you imagine if our army prepared that much? How would you guys like to know that our army... Our armed forces prepared that much. I can tell you we'd wonder that for a little while and then we wouldn't have the freedoms we have. <laughs> right? I'm not trying to be mean or sarcastic, but seeing these face and these, these issues, the fact that you can strengthen your marriage by coming up to church. Did you know also that if you're a single Christian and you go to church, 
you're nearly 80 times more likely to marry someone that you're happier with. 80 times. Single people, I tell us all the time, I had a buddy of mine, he's, he's a single man, he was just kept bad relationship after bad relationship. I'm like, go to church. <laughs> time for you to go to church. Know Jesus and then find a woman. I said, that's, that's, where, that's where to go. You want to find a woman, find Jesus. You want to find a man, find Jesus, and he'll bring you someone if it's meant to be. Now, ladies, I hate to disappoint you. Your odds are against you. There's a 20% deficit of men compared to you if you're in an evangelical church. So some of you may be single. You want to know something? God's got a purpose and plan for you. You will never hear me push you to get married. Mother Teresa is one of my top 10 figures in life that I admire. She wasn't married. And it's timeless. You can say her name and everybody knows who she is. So don't think if you're single, it's an issue. Emily, is Emily here? Can I embarrass her then? Good, awesome. I remember one time she really said something that was profound. She said, I am sick and tired of Christians telling me I need a man to be complete. I just need Jesus. Huh? So you guys ever get a chance to talk to Emily? She's, she's, pretty, she's pretty awesome. She's a good friend of Mary and I's. Mary adores her. But now for the message since I don't have a lot of time. I don't mean to be harsh this morning, but I, I'm just, the older I get, the less I have time for biblical ignorance. You know, and I'm seeing it. I'm seeing time and again. I, we've got a, I've got a new one I'm dealing with. That's just amazing. I would have never thought I would have to deal with this kind of theology. It's just like, come on, people, open your Bible and read it. I encourage every Christian to take a theophostics class and a humanetics class. Pastor John, would you agree? I think it'd be good. But if anything, grab a Greek Hebrew. I think you'd be really amazed at what you see. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for today. And Father, I thank you for this church. So glad to be part of it, God. I'm glad I'm part of the family. And Lord, may we just uh, be able to hear from you this morning and understand from you what it is that we want. In your precious name, Mary, we said, Amen. Acts 2, it says, With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept his mass message were baptized, about 3,000, and were added to their number that day. That was one place, 3,000 people. I can't fit them in my house. How about you? It says later that they met in the synagogues every morning. So when we talk about how often should the church meet, oh, that's a pretty good example. <laughs> So if you want to talk about home church and, and the big church, I'm going to call this the big church, you need to be part of the big church and the small church. That's how we go out and reach the world. That's how we go out and pull people in. That's how we establish relationships with one another on an intimate level. You can't get to know someone well one day a week. On Tuesday, I wrote a list of all the men in this congregation I wanted to get to know well. I have no idea how I'm going to do it. But some of you have gotten messages from me in a week. I'm going at it methodically, so wait your turn. I'll get to you. <laughs> Ben's like, where you at? <laughs> and so, get on there, Ben. We, ben and I got together, but it's been a while. We need to eat again. But, uh, man, I love you guys. And ladies, I love you too. And I, my, my, our church staff has a heart for you. But listen, God's got a very specific purpose and plan. It goes on to say after this, about 3,000 were added that day, it says, that says the fellowship of believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. I want you to note, it first talks about everybody who heard his message. The gospel went forward. And then we saw the healings. We saw the signs and wonders. We're not exactly sure they're healings, to be honest with you. We assume that. We just know there were signs and wonders. I don't know, but how many of you, let me, I'm going to segue a little bit. How many of you would rather see someone's heart get healed over a leg? Right? How many would love to see a leg get healed, though? <laughs> yeah. Let's not lose sight of the importance. Right? We want to... We talk healing and all these other things. God loves the heart as much as he does the body, but we don't, we don't inherit this into heaven. And sometimes we get so fixed on healing or we get so fixed on the heart that we don't realize the two work together. 
And so we see these signs and wonders, and I'm believing it was everything. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Look at that. Had everything in common. You go back and look at this, and actually context, it actually means the burden and burden together. They had the burden together. Do we have the burden together? I think so. They sold property and possessions to give to anybody who had need. I didn't get an amen after that. <laughs> Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. The reason why they met in temple courts was it was shown that there wasn't enough room for them to fit inside the church. So they actually went from the church out into the temple courts. That's actually how it went. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There's a great model for the church. Big home world. Listen, if the church was not to come together regularly, why did Paul spend so much time reaching out to the churches, encouraging them to meet together? Why do we see in Acts here the account in which they spilled from big to small and out? It's to equip you guys. We see it through the New Testament that the size of the church doesn't matter. What matters is if it's healthy. Amen? Amen. We want to be healthy. We want to be healthy. So number one, one reason to go to church is to grow in Christ by hearing the preached message, to grow in the depth of the knowledge of the word. That's twofold. One is, listen, us as pastors, I promise you, because I know us as pastors, we all take this right here very seriously. I promise you, that our heart is to preach the message that God has for us. Not the message Don or Pastor John or Pastor Roger or Pastor Kent has, but with all sincerity, the message God has for you. And when you're here, you receive it. When you're missing, you miss out on it. And what it does is the message we bring forward hopefully cuts you to the soul and heart like it does us. And hopefully you're going home and meditating on that word and looking through that word and being in agreement with that word and if not, you're bringing it forth. Ephesians 4 points to this. Says, so Christ himself, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. We need all those. I literally... Oh, man, like, this is not fun. I'm going to segue again really quick. No, I won't. <laughs> to equip his people for works of service. He gave all those to equip the people to work for service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Listen, that's so critical. Look at what it's saying right there. It says, listen, you need to work together in these things. You need to be under this. You need to be listening to what they're bringing forth, teaching you so that you can work together so your faith may be built to a point of unity. Isn't that, God's incredible because I've witnessed it in, in the ministries we have, right? In our family fest, the unity that goes on in there, the worship team, the unity that goes in there, us as pastors, the unity, elders, trustees, you guys, when you worship this morning, Teresa sent me a picture, that's my phone went off back there, it's her fault, of you guys worshiping. And, and it was all of you. You can't see me, which is perfect. It was you guys worshiping before God, sending it out to him. We must understand that he's put those people in place to equip us, to teach us. Also goes back, there will no longer be infants tossed back and forth in the waves. You know, a lot of things happen. I'll tell you right now, 95% to 99% of the couples I counsel, me and Mary, or the people that we reach out in the world and counsel, those people are people that started in church and stopped coming. On a regular basis. Grow in Christ by hearing the preached message and growing in the depth of the word by following through. Paul, while facing certain death, writes his letter to Timothy, Timothy on his, enroll, his important word of the role. Oh, jeepers. <laughs> on his importance, his role in the church. 
says, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with patience and careful instruction. Listen, none of us like to be corrected. We don't. Pastor Roger and I just had a discussion. Hopefully you don't mind me sharing this. We used to talk about how we didn't like meeting. For what, probably first six years, Pastor, right? And, and Mary knows this. Every time the phone would ring, I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble again. That's what it felt like, right? But you want to know something? I did it. One is God calls me to be under authority. Number two is I knew Roger loved me. Right? And so, and later he confessed, he says, Don, I felt the same way. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, I called Don, you know. But pastor knew I needed correction. I needed teaching. And, and you, you all know I'm far from perfect. I need that. And I continually need it. And so that's where I got Pastor John and Pastor Roger and Pastor Ken. These guys correct and guide and rebuke me. And I promise you, without that, I wouldn't even be here. I don't even know where I'd be. So, yeah, we're here for a reason. It's our calling to shepherd you guys. And that's why we're here. And like I said, how would you like it if we just showed up a few times? Just 30 times a year, we just read our Bible and showed up at church. That's it. I'm pretty sure you would be able to tell by what's going on up here, but I don't think any of us would like that. Number two, God's word tells us to, period. He tells us to do it so that we can encourage one another, we can be encouraged, and through fellowship, we can bear each other's burdens. I know, for me, you guys have bared a lot of my burdens, and I appreciate that. You guys are, I don't know where I'd be. And the same can be said for all of us. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. It's funny he uses the word spur. <laughs> spur each other on. Spur, spurs aren't fun. I'm sure if, if I spurred you, and it's a similar context, it actually means to, to prod one on or to push, much like they did with a slave to work in the fields. So it's not exactly a kind line. Hey, sometimes it's, let's go. Love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together. How many of you know someone that feels church is like a spectator thing? Like I just need to show up once in a while and I'll be good and I'm still, I'm still for the team. I'm going to go to the stadium. I'm going to watch it on TV once a week. I mean once a month. How many of you know people like that? Let's be honest. Right? I'm looking around and some of the people I feel like should be hearing this aren't here. But here's the thing that doesn't get it done. It says, do not give up on meeting together. As some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Listen, we know the day is approaching. We know today is closer to Jesus coming back and everything else than it was yesterday. I know that. I just don't know the hour, the day, or the time yet. None of us will. The Bible tells us we'll only know the season. That's why I laugh when people try to pin it down. Go moving on. First Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5.11. Cool. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as in fact you are doing. Number three, to corporately worship together. Tuning into God and his Holy Spirit that brings a unity and wisdom to our church body. Colossians 3 says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Listen, music worship is just one way to worship. It says, through all wisdom, the psalms and the songs, through the Spirit. When we worship in the Spirit together, when we come together corporately, something supernatural happens. And don't tell me this morning you couldn't feel it. If you couldn't, I pray for you and continue to pray why you couldn't. He was here. He's always here. Four, to discover, grow, and use your gifts. I put in all caps in my notes, we all have a place. I don't know why. Like, I just feel like, you all have a place. Don't sit in the pew thinking you don't have a gift to give. You all have a place here. It doesn't matter what, there's tons of gifts. God has a place for you here. 
listen, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. We love those, right? Because it talks about the serving and it talks, let's, let me just flip that really quick. It's the love, and then after, uh, <laughs> clock, that stupid clock. There are, there's always next week. Now, this is already a two-part series, John. <laughs> there's always a week after. Where was I going? Oh, yeah, First Corinthians. Okay, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow you other, other, oh jeepers, somehow or other, you were, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one says, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. So there's unity, right? Despite the different callings we have, there's unity underneath the Spirit. And it, I'm just going to paraphrase it because of time. But when we go through here, we see, now each is a manifestation, right? And it goes through and talks about the manifestation of each of our, each of our gifts. And what I love is, can you flip down to like nine? I think it's nine. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healing. To that one spirit. Keep going. Here it is. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking different types of tongues. And still another to interpretation of tongues. Here's a whole list of different spirits, right? Keep going. All of these work for one and the same spirit. He distributes them each as he determines. We need them all. Just as a body through one has many parts, but all of it has parts from one body, so it is with Christ. And we're going to stop there for out of that, because next week I'll be talking a little bit more about what it looks like to be part of a church member, to be a church member. But I'm telling you guys why church is important. It's important because it helps us discover our gifts. First Peter 4 through 10. I'm going back a little bit. First Corinthians 12 and 13 also tells us how to love, right? Do you guys remember that? Love is patient. Love is kind. I hate the word patient. It actually means long-suffering. That means we suffer long together. But it's all about fellowship and being in the church. It's within the church that you exercise your gifts and are built up in them to go out in the world and use them. All right? So we get our basic equipment. It's like boot camp. This is boot camp. Now you're going to go out and soldier, you're going to go claim those souls. Moving on because of time. But it says, 1 Peter 4.10, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. We should use it to serve each other. To serve others. Number five, to give our kids a solid foundation of faith and truth. Statistics show that kids whose parents attended church at least one service a week with their kids find that the kids are minimally a third less likely to do drugs. Alcohol, They have the lowest levels, the lowest levels of problems in school. They also rank the highest in the population of being reported to be happy and satisfied despite bad circumstances. I'm reminded in Luke 6 where Jesus reminds us that, he, that the teached will be like the teacher. He says, the teached will be like the teacher. It says, he also told them a parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teachers. What do you want your kids to look like? If you, you, know, if you want them to go to church once a month, go to church once a month. But to me, statistically, you're setting them up for failure. If you want to go to church, I'm bold in saying I believe you should be in church as much as possible, especially on a Sunday when you corporately meet. And you should get plugged into a small group. I didn't, if you guys notice, I didn't bring up the average statistic how much time you spend on your phone because that, like, is so much bigger than you spending time at church, small groups, reading the Word, and praying cumulatively together. In fact, I can take two times the amount of that, and you still wouldn't reach it. Three times, four times, five times. Yeah, it's nearly ten times, you guys. So where is your treasure? So is your heart. We need to give our kids a firm foundation. These kids are also 
bigger group of numbers volunteering in their community than the average human, the average student. We need to train our kids. Matthew 18, 6 says, If anyone causes one of these littles to stumble, those who believe in me to stumble, would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, this is a, what we call a twofold meaning to it. He grabbed the child. He was talking with the child, but he was also meaning those Christians. And so what are you doing if your child's heard the faith to build them in it? Because if you ain't building them, you're leading them astray. Right? If someone comes up to me and I know the directions of how to get home, to their home, and I tell them I don't know, what? I've led them astray. They're still going to be lost. To build your marriage. A very small percentage of you said you'd like to reduce your odds to 3%. Um, I don't even know if I should bring this one up. I'm just being facetious here. But it says, by taking time to center ourselves around Jesus Christ, by a regular devotion to God through church service, its activities, we learn to emulate Jesus Christ and the body of believers that he called us to be and learn how to ex exercise these attributes to become a good spouse. Listen, you're not going to know how to lay down your life as though Christ did from the church. It, listen, he laid his life down before he got to the cross. Everybody's like, well, he just died for them. That's what it means. I'm supposed to jump in front of a bullet for my wife. Okay, how many bullets are zooming by your wife's head every day? Spiritual arrows. Bullets, yeah. Flaming ones. But listen, Jesus, Jesus already died long before he went to the cross because he laid himself aside. He did his Father's will. And that's what we're supposed to do. I sat down with a gentleman one time and he was like, well, I don't know why I got to do that. She shows me no respect, nothing, and we're going on and on and on. And I said, okay, well, where's it, when's it going to stop? When's it going to stop? It's funny because Jesus didn't tell God like, hey, I'm not going down there dying on the cross until they're nice to me. <laughs> until they respect me. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes something's got to break. I can guarantee you there's times where I treat my wife in a manner I don't want to treat her, but God tells me to. And there's times where I treat her in a manner where God does not honor it at all. I know the difference. And you should. If you don't, you should be spending more time in the Word than in the pew. If you read and pray at least six times, six days a week, and go to church at least one time a week, your odds of divorce in an evangelical charismatic church drop to 13%. What's funny is we also talk about what love is, and like I said before, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 was actually wrote to the church how to admonish love to each other. But obviously, if, if I'm supposed to be loving you guys, it's the same way I should love my spouse to a greater level. Number seven, our pastors give us spiritual protection and help us find the lessons in our struggles and trials. How many of you have had a struggle or trial in the last year? So some of you had it easy. Thank the Lord for that. All right. But how, how do we do that? Listen, there's tons of verses about being on, underneath the umbrella of cover. And, and actually, one of them I hit on before. He gave us pastors and teachers and elders, right? But we also have Hebrews 13, 17. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They will watch over you as men who trust give an account. Must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden for them. <laughs> Preach! <laughs> for that would be of no advantage to you. Roger's smiling. Be of no burden. But listen, we already have a burden when we're called to be a pastor. And we want the best for you guys. And there's a reason why God says submit. It's not like so we can dictate what you guys do and turn you into a cult. I mean, that's not our calling, right? Some people, I think, fear that. But what it is is that we can keep you from harm from the evil one. Some of the hardest parts of the week are sitting down as a pastor staff and talking about you guys. Now listen, we don't know what we don't know. If you got someone sick, someone's in a hospital, great, tell us. But don't expect us to show up because we got a lot going on and we don't know. And so uh, don't 
think that we don't care because we don't show up. Sometimes it's because we don't know. Sometimes we just can't. But we have a church body of believers. I had someone come up to me and say, Well, Pastor Don, we're forgetting about so-and-so and so-and-so. And I saw this new so-and-so and they forgot him. I said, Great! Shame on you! <laughs> And they were upset at me. And I'm like, why are you mad at me? And they're like, that's your job. And I said, find that in the Bible for me because I don't see that I'm taking care of new people. We're all supposed to. And if you recognized it and I didn't, it's because I didn't know and you knew. Shame on you. Go find that person. Our, we, guys, I can't even tell you how much... I quit a job not to work, and I'm working. I, it was funny. I'm getting paid to do a job I don't work at, and I'm not getting paid for a job I'm working at. <laughs> John's probably working 78 hours a week. I don't even know what Roger's doing. I mean, not, Kent's doing. Roger's busy. He should be healing, and he's still pastoring. If he doesn't get his 16 years, it's, it's because we were a burden to him. Listen, if you know, help us. Also, if someone comes complains to you about something we're not doing, say, good, I'm going to math you this one. Go see them. That's my favorite. And, you, and I know some of you know that. I'll be like, well, talk to Roger. I'll listen. But you're going to go talk to Pastor Roger. Otherwise, I'm not doing anything about it. That's just the way it is. <laughs> the other way we, we offer spiritual protection is by sharing the word with you, the truth, to hopefully keep you from going down the wrong path to help you lead you when you don't have the answers. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4 says, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers. Not because you must, but because you are willing, and God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those trusted to you, but being examples of... I laugh when it says not greedy for money, because I guarantee you none of the pastors here are greedy for money because of what they get paid. Um, but it says because you are willing. Because you are willing. You can't pay someone enough to be a pastor, I promise you. They have to be called. They have to be called. Your pastors love you, care for you, hurt with you, grieve with you, celebrate with you, and toil with you. Because they love you. Number eight is to find godly mentors. Realize that we all need mentors and we are called to be mentors. You should never be a person that's always getting mentored. There needs to be a time where you move on from the mentoring <laughs> to the mentor. <laughs> I laugh because we deal with this. It's time to grow up. And that's what the church is here for. And, you, and I know some of us have had to hear I've had to hear it in my life. It's time to grow up. Listen, if, you're, if you've been mentored for more than two years and you're not mentoring someone else, something's wrong there. You can continue to be mentored. There's nothing wrong with that. But you should be mentoring. If you want to read more about that, Titus 2. Titus chapter 2. That, that whole chapter is about what it looks like and what God thinks of it. <sighs> I'm just going to skip to the last one. My final point, if all these aren't good enough for you, the statistics, the biblical knowledge, the verses, is this. Jesus went to church and he called us to be like him. In Luke 4, 16 it says he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went in the synagogue as it was his custom. Jesus went to church. He was under authority, he studied the word and he helped the church. Church was important enough for God to put in the Bible. Church was important enough for Paul to write letters to, to write to his disciples and the men he'd mentored and women so that we become a stronger church. Listen, the church is what founded America. 
The church is why we have in God we trust. Just because the world's fallen away from it doesn't mean we're supposed to. It says, do not fall for the easy schemes of this world. We're to be set apart, amen? Let's stand and pray. Get you guys out of here. Two minutes late. Guys, I want you to know God loves you. Jesus loves you. You know what's cool? Is he wants you to come here and count him. You can count on God anywhere, but he likes to do it corporately because it builds each other up. He needs nothing. He has everything, but he wants you. He wants the church, and we're going to grow. Amen? So next week we're going to be talking about what does a good, healthy church member look like. Let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you, first of all, for every single member that's here and not here. God, I pray may they feel the burden of each other. May they share that. And may they not be anguished by it, but encouraged by it to pray for one another, to intercede for one another. God, may we have a desire to want to be here. May we just have a a longing to be like, I'm showing up on Sunday because I want to be here as much as I can. And Lord God, I just pray that even this morning as your Holy Spirit was moving, God, that you may, you may reach down and touch us. God, in your precious and mighty name, we just thank you for your word, for your truth, and your spirit, and what Jesus did on the cross for us. In your precious and mighty name, everybody said, amen. amen.